there's a third side too, which is the centre, which seems to be moving a little bit further to the right as a response to, you know, what they see as sort of horrific wokeism. Pretty much every cultural conflict that doesn't relate to economics. So, um, so pretty much everything that people yell about on social media or yell at each other on social media about. Uh, so everything from, so over the decades, it's been, you know, abortion, book banning, the satanic panic, uh, which is, you know, the idea that um, that Satanists were were influencing America's children through uh, secret rituals and heavy metal songs, um, through to Black Lives Matter, Antifa, lockdown, COVID. Uh, so yeah, cultural conflicts that don't involve economics. I think facts in general uh, are going through a, a bad time of late. Um, the the right um, operate often with these sort of big conspiratorial baroque sort of balls out lies about you know pedophile cabals and so on in pizza restaurants and that kind of stuff. Uh, the left um, it's a different kind of lie. I think it's more sort of ideological led journalism where which is a similar kind of magical thinking or wishful thinking where uh where the ideology comes before the evidence gathering so so i think like across the spectrum there's kind of a sort of war on on truth elon musk recently said that you know let, let's sort of throw everything in there and let the people figure out what's true and what's not true and that's what he's trying to do on twitter but it's a it's a disaster um you know, I went onto Twitter the other day to try and figure out what was going on with the Jeffrey Epstein um, releases. And I stayed in there for like three minutes because immediately I saw fake Jimmy Kimmel was part of it. And that was just, you know, fake. And, and I just threw my hands up and sort of scuttled back to the legacy media in, in the hope that, uh, you know, their editorial standards would be higher. I think every side, and there's a third side too, which is the centre, which seems to be moving a little bit further to the right as a response to, you know, what they see as sort of horrific wokeism. Um, so there's more than two sides. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think each individual case, there's somebody is behaving worse than somebody else. <laughs> I would say that in general, it, it, but well, look, completely anecdotally, this is not scientific, what I'm about to tell yeah. you. But in both seasons of Things Fell Apart, you know, I, I went into, into each story without any, you know, without wanting to peddle any agenda of my own. And I'd say, you know, the slight majority of the stories are stories about bad behaviour coming from, from the right. But in both seasons, there's a few episodes where, you know, if, if anybody comes over a little bit worse, it's it's the left. Certain, certain leaders, I think, you know, obviously try to stoke the culture wars in a very, you know, in a way that's very reminiscent to me of, you know, what Marx said about religion being the opium of the people. Like, you know, maybe the culture wars are, are peddled to us as the opium of the people while the rich continue to get richer. Uh, Ron DeSantis is a good example of that. I mean, he's basing his entire... Um, campaign for president on on the culture wars, uh, Florida is where woke goes to die, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it's and it's definitely bleeding into parties in Britain too. Um, I'm not sure how well that's going to work though in in the next elections. To be honest, I, I think um, uh, I think people are beginning to feel a little bit manipulated and and want to keep on point to the cost of living crisis and and the economy and so on. So whether that works or not, I don't know. Uh, but there's a whole bunch of other things going on too. You know, you've got the tech utopians who know that the more enraged they can make us, the more engaged we are and the more money they will make. Uh, that's not really working on Twitter now though, right? I mean, Twitter seems to be like a very broken machine. Uh, but at the same time, it's all it's all of us. You know, when, you know, I wrote a book in 2015, so you've been publicly shamed about the, the dangers of the rise of public shaming on social media. And one of the things that's happening is that shamed people, transgressors, um, because of our overuse of shame, they're becoming like 
kind of hospital super bugs impervious to shame. And and when we, and as Naomi Klein says in Doppelganger, you know, when we eject somebody from the community, they don't dissolve, they go to a kind of a different world, an upside down world, where quite often they do better than ever because they're surrounded by other bruised people who, who you know, have their own gripes about mainstream society. First series, the stories take place over 50 years. Uh, the origin stories of the culture wars over 50 years. The second series takes place over about 20 days. Um, it, it, unplanned by me, but it turned out that every story that we looked at um, pretty much all blew up within 20 days of each other in May 2020, six weeks into lockdown. And then I go back and trace the origin stories. And quite often the, the, the best stuff about things fell apart isn't the culture where, where it ends up with Antifa, or a COVID conspiracy or whatever. It's the journey that takes you there, these extraordinary, twisty, turny stories that start where you least expect them. So in episode one, it starts with the mysterious deaths of 32 women in Miami in the 1980s. And then we draw a direct path from these mysterious deaths right through to, um, uh, to the murder of George Floyd during lockdown. So that's episode one. Another story is about a, a scientist called Judy Mikovits who had a terrible employment conflict in the 2000s and um, ended up very, you know, burnt by her employers and doubled down and tripled down. And that ends with the first great COVID conspiracy theory uh, pandemic. Other stories are about how media polarisation led to us Poor family going on a lockdown escaping camping trip. There's this family from the Pacific Northwest who were Twilight fans. And when the lockdown restrictions were lifted, they decided to go on a Twilight themed camping trip in, in the forests of um, the Pacific Northwest. And as soon as they arrived in this town, they realised they were being followed by um, armed townspeople who then barricaded them into their campsite by chopping down trees with chainsaws and they were unwitting pawns in an extraordinary culture war. I won't give away the twists, but uh, that's another one of the stories. Uh, I think it's I think it's it's already your way. It's there. It's yeah. it's endemic. Um I think the uh, the only real difference that I can tell and the reason why so many of my stories are American is that there's something about the the storytelling in America that, that makes it so interesting. I think the actual divisions and the way that we now define ourselves as being in opposition to one another, the kind of dysfunctions that all of this is creating in our inner lives and society, I don't really see any difference. I, I think the reason why so many of my stories are American is because Americans are just sort of better at telling their stories than British people are sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and maybe the twists and turns can be sort of more Baroque in America for some reason. But I think the issues, there's really no difference as far as I can tell. My, my sense is that, um, is that when it comes to the elections, people aren't going to be, you know, to quote the who, I think people aren't going to be formed again. I, I think... Um, I think the culture wars are going to play a smaller part. I could be wrong, I think, but I think the culture wars are going to play a smaller part than you might think in both the British and the American elections, and it's going to be much more about inflation. And and, and hopefully that will be a sort of salutary lesson for, for our leaders, both in the tech and the political and the media worlds, who think that they can make money out of stoking our rage for each other. Because I hope and think that maybe people are starting to get sick of it. I remember years ago, my friend Adam Curtis, you know, said before when social media was still a utopia, he said to me, you know, this is going to be like those 80s dystopian movies like Escape from New York, where, you know, warrior gangs take over a city and then all the regular people, you know, escape to the suburbs. And I think we're now escaping to the suburbs of the internet where things aren't quite so rageful.